money and politics. So, okay, let's start with a little quiz here. Um, who here makes tech for money? in exchange for money. I do, I am a professional programmer, that's what I do for my job. Who here makes tech at a tech company, a company that primarily sells tech? Okay, that's some too, not everyone does that. Um, who here uses products programmed at a tech company? Say Twitter, Facebook, yeah, most of us do, almost everybody does. Um, who pays for products programmed at a tech company? Maybe you run, give money to Amazon Web Services. Maybe you donate through Patreon, something like that. Okay, so I wanted to say money a lot, and I wanted to say tech company a lot, because that's the theme of this talk. Um, what I, the reason why I started like that is because we are all part, all of us who raised our hands, and I would venture that everyone in this room is part of an economy um, that involves these tech companies and exchanging money and wealth being created. Most of the wealth being created by tech companies these days, some of it is from the sale, direct sale of products or services that people make. A lot of the like very large amounts of wealth that are generated though are through what they call exit events. And what that means is that's an, an, a public offering on a stock market or a sale for a very large sum of money of a company, and the profits from that event are split between shareholders. And sometimes that's employees, often that involves some amount of early employees in a company, people who did make the products, whose labor created whatever is being sold. But often it's mostly investors, and these are people who've given the people who make the products money in exchange for a fraction of the ownership. And we call very early investors in tech companies and other companies as well venture capitalists because they're like cowboys in a Victorian novel. Um, I don't know why, it has something to do with the risk, that's why they call them venture capitalists. But um, most of the wealth generated in these exit events goes to venture capitalists. And I wanted to give that definition because I'm gonna be talking a lot about venture capital today. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna use the abbreviation VC for that. And so those of us who work for tech companies who, you know, either before or after these events, our, our labor is going to grow those investments of VCs. And all those of us who, you know, give money to buy tech products, that money is going to grow that investment. And that wealth that's generated is spent on a lot of things. Um, of all different types. Uh, some of the things increasingly are political. They're political campaigns and races. And so what exactly are they being spent on? Well, nationally, a lot of it is going to, to um, Obama. That's a big story, tech money supporting Obama and other national candidates. Um, also lobbyists, like other industries, the tech industry has lobbyists. Nationally, the priorities of the tech industry are immigration, tax policy, cybersecurity, and net neutrality. I am not gonna talk about any of those things. Why am I not gonna talk about any of those things? Well, <laughs> nobody talks about immigration in the tech industry. Um, I would love to hear a talk or read about that, by the way, if you do talk about that or write about that, please let me know. It's not, it's not something I, um, I'm gonna speak about today. Tax policy, tech companies want the same thing everyone else does, they want to not pay their taxes. Um, cybersecurity and net neutrality, there are other people who talk about this and talk about it far better than I do. Um, Instead, what I'm gonna talk about is there's a trend of this money being spent at a lower level, below sort of national um, investment and at a state and even a smaller local level. And I wanna talk about that. Um, I think these local actions have more impact on our day-to-day -day life and I believe we're gonna see more and more of them for reasons I'm gonna lay out. I will admit a bias towards California and the Bay Area. As Ash mentioned, I originally was gonna give this talk in LA. I am from California. Um, I'm gonna justify it a couple ways. One is that San Francisco is my hometown, so it's what I know. Another one is that a lot of the money made here does end up there, um, because a lot of these big corporations that are funding this, and a lot of the capitalists, that venture capitalists that are funding um, the companies you work for here are based in California and the Bay Area. Tech hubs around the country are being built on this model, so it's something you're seeing. And we're all being priced out and moving up there, up here, so um, we're bringing it with us. Um, so, Let's talk about what tech money cares about on a state and regional level. Does anybody, has anyone heard of this? Did this make it up here? Yeah, six Californias. So six Californias is a plan to split, split California into six states, you know, small government or whatever. Totally unworkable, completely impractical. 
Um, it's a ballot initiative in California. If you get enough signatures, you can put something on the ballot to be voted on. Didn't get enough ballot signs in 2014. They collected a million, only 750K or so were ballot. They're not trying for 2016. This is Tim Draper. Tim Draper is a billionaire venture capitalist. He is the son of another billionaire venture capitalist, and he is the grandson of another billionaire venture capitalist. And his son is also a venture capitalist. Um, he is the founder of Draper Fisher Drivets and Associates. Uh, some of his investments with that firm include Skype, um, Hotmail, Tesla, uh, Baidu, which is the search engine in China, um, Twitch, and an unaccredited university named after him in San Mateo offering degrees in entrepreneurship. Um, it's 100% real. Uh, he is the sole funder of Six Californias. He's the only person who's paid any money for Six Californias. And he's poured $5 million of his own money into collecting those signatures to get on the ballot. At least in 2014. We don't know what the numbers are for the next round of trying to get on the ballot. So this is sort of like a wacky rich guy, right? Like eccentric. Um, the only kind of issue, this is in his university. Like all the seating in Draper University is beanbags. Um, and this would be significantly more like wacky if it was his first uh, entrance into politics, which it is not. So in, 2000, in the year 2000, um, turns out there was like another time semi-recently where there was all this money floating around and people needed to know what to do with it coming from tech, but we don't talk about that. Um, but in 2000, he put on the ballot um, a proposition for voters called Proposition 38. Prop 38 proposed to give every student in the state $4,000 to attend private school with no regulation whatsoever. Um, privatizing public education. He spent a record-breaking $23 million of his own money on it, which is uh, huge. It's far to the right of even the most ardent um, school choice, is what they call that, sort of policy advocates. And it failed, it failed overwhelmingly, but not before its opponents spent another $30 million on it. This is still probably firmly in beanbag territory in terms of like viable political campaigns, except that at that point he was actually fresh off a stint on the State Board of Education. So he had been appointed there by Governor Pete Wilson. Um, his main qualifications for the State Board of Education was that he had fundraised for Governor Pete Wilson. And um, the Board of Education has a ton of power. They set education policy. They adopt textbooks. They measure the outcomes. They decide what to measure. And they decide whether to continue the policy. When Pete Wilson was replaced as governor in 1999, Tim Draper was not reappointed. However, Reed Hastings was. And you probably know him as the CEO of Netflix. He's also on the board of Facebook. He was on the board of Microsoft. And Hastings was already rich when he founded Netflix. He uh, had a $750 million acquisition early in the first boom. He's a huge major, major, major Democratic donor. Um, and he was a special supporter of the newly elected governor, Gray Davis. He stayed on the Board of Education much longer than Draper. He was actually president of the Board of Education in California for four years. He actually had his own big bunny school bill on the ballot in 2000. Prop 39 was um, designed to reduce the threshold to pass local school bond measures from 66% to 55%. Passed super easily, um, probably at least thanks in part to outspending its opponents six to one. They raised $31.5 million to pass Prop 39. That was one million of that was Reed's own personal money, but it was a thanks in big part to Reed's buddy and his campaign co-chair John Doerr. John Doerr is the billionaire partner at Kleiner Perkins Calfield and Byers, who you probably have heard of in conjunction with the recent Ellen Powell sex discrimination case. Um, yeah, Kleiner Perkins and Doerr made their huge amount of wealth by investing in basically any tech product you've ever used. Um, Google, Amazon, AOL, Intuit, Sun, EA, Genentech, Zynga, pop it. See, I threw in some local like her. Um, so for Prop 39, K, uh, Kleiner Perkins plus Doerr ended up um, investing more than $8 million between the partners and Doerr himself and the company. Uh, made from investments in those companies, they invested, in, they, they um, paid more than $8 million to pass, pass Prop 39. So like, you have to start thinking, right, $31 million, $8 million from, Cl eight million from Kleiner Perkins, all that just to like lower the voting threshold for school bonds, it's kind of esoteric. 
It turns out that there's a proposition of Prop 39 that actually has nothing to do with bond funding. Um, Charter schools are private organizations that can be nonprofit or for profit that run public schools and they're funded by taxpayer dollars per student. It's been a growing movement over the last 20 years um, to sort of grow and encourage these charter schools. That Prop 59 requires that public districts provide charter schools with space reasonably equivalent to those used by non charter students in the district and they have to be identically furnished and they have to be in the area the charter school wants. Um, the LA Unified School District has fulfilled this request via the controversial practice of co-location, um, which is literally putting the charter schools in the same building as non-charter schools. It hasn't gone very well. Um, and this culminated recently in a drawn-out series of lawsuits against the LA Unified School District by the California Charter Schools Association. Where am I going with this? Well, guess who's on the board of the CC California Charter Schools Association? Reed Hastings is on the board. He's also an investor in Aspire, which is California's largest charter provider. There's another couple of tech VCs on that board. He's on the board of KIPP, which is a massive nationwide charter network. Um, the CEO of Viacom and the former director of Bain Capital, which has a very big tech investment arm and is funded optimizely run the runway LinkedIn, are on the board of KIPP as well. Uh, Hastings is also on the board and a major investor in rocket, the rocket ship K-5 charter now. Um, they're known for their aggressive growth. They actually have their own real estate company to buy land to build new schools on. And this is a really tech-heavy charter network. Um, their former CEO, John Danner, is rich from the first boom. Uh, they've got a ton of tech investors, including the CFO of Skype, um, Cheryl Sandberg from Facebook. Arthur Rock, who's a legendary venture VC, who invested in Fairchild Semi, Apple, and Intel. Um, Menlo Ventures, who invested in Uber and Warby Parker. Excel Partners, who funded Etsy and Dropbox. Benchmark Capital, who um, have funded, among many others, Snapchat, Instagram, and Yelp. And then the aforementioned Kleiner Perkins and John Doerr are all in on Rocket for more than a billion dollars. And that's a lot of tech people, right? It's a lot of tech money that's going from those companies. And in fact, there's a ton of tech money in the charter movement. It's kind of everywhere you look. Um, Lauren Powell Jobs, who's Steve's job widow, much, much of her philanthropy that's been sort of lauded since his death has been to charter schools via her Emerson Collective Education Fund. Um, Jeff Bezos' family and Paul Allen have given a lot of money in Washington to establish charter schools. Mark Zuckerberg's million dollar donation to Newark schools was focused entirely on charter schools. And here in Oregon, Stanford Children, which is a long-standing advocacy group, in the past few years has taken on a bunch of VCs and Ryan Finley, who's the founder of SurveyMonkey, and pivoted to focus on school reform. So what are they spending all that money on these charter schools? Well, as sort of state um, initiatives that allow charters to operate have passed, They've started to turn their focus from state to local governments, and they're pouring just an unprecedented amount of dollars into school board elections, local school board elections. Um, in 2012, $185,000 went from tech-funded uh, political action you know, committees to school board elections. $150,000 in 2014. West Contra County, which is a county in the East Bay of the Bay Area, saw $350,000 in 2014 in their school board election. And this is even going farther afield. We saw $285,000 in the Minneapolis school board race last year from our third working friends. It's happening in New Jersey, it's happening in New Orleans, it's happening all over the country. And this is really an order of magnitude over the normal amount of money you're seeing in a school board race. So this is, this is a new thing and it's a lot of money going into relatively small elections. So like, why? <laughs> well, what's wrong? Sort of reading Hastings has a couple quotes here that explains why they're spending this money. And if you ask what's wrong with school districts, this is sort of an answer he has. He says the fundamental problem with school districts is that they don't get to control their boards. The importance of the charter school movement is to evolve America from a system where governance is constantly changing. So if you'll allow me to paraphrase, what's wrong with school districts? It's definitely their democratically elected school boards, right? Um, <laughs> And one stated outward goal of the charter school movement is to shrink school board power. And this is where the opposition to charters generally happens is at the school board level, right? So, like, what? that doesn't really, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit of a toddler here to answer a why question with another why, but why, right? 
So they're doing this to further the charter school movement, but why is the tech money so invested in the charter school movement? And so this second quote, I think, is pretty instructive to that. Hastings says, the school district still exists in New Orleans, which famously has gone all charter, I believe, since 2012, bringing to town more and more charter school networks, sort of like a chamber of commerce would to develop business. I hope it will become a long-term model for great education. So a thing about charter schools is that they're really heavy advocates of something called blended learning. And that's classroom time backed up by computer-based instruction. And in fact, there are charter school networks, including starting as young as kindergarten, that are entirely online, entirely online schooling. It's a ton of online work. That requires a lot of software. And there's a newish sector called EdTech that's been growing hugely, um, especially K-12 in the last four years, that's focused around providing this software. So this is stuff like online classes, apps to drill for tests, classroom management, things like that. Um, this is big money stuff. Dreambox, which is an online math education app, was recently bought for eight figures by Reed Hastings and John Doerr, and now used in all rocket ship schools. The former CEO of Rocket Ship left to develop an app that's now used in schools. The founder of Kip left to, find, uh, to head an ed tech company. There are now VC firms that focus only on ed tech. And there are multiple ed tech accelerators. There are some that are focused only on K-12 ed tech that are building companies to build software to sell to these schools. The size of the K-12 market is projected to be over $800 billion with a B for ed tech. So that's huge, it's a pretty huge market opportunity, right? And there are definitely challenges of investing in ed tech. So this quote is from Mark Andreessen, who's famous for building Netscape and then for investing in many, many companies and for pontificating on Twitter. Um, and he says, I wouldn't want to back a business that's selling to public schools or characterized by public financing, unions, or government-run institutions. Those institutions are incredibly hostile to change. Now what I think is an important to point out about this quote is that Mark Andreessen does invent invest in ed tech. He's not saying he wouldn't invest in ed tech. He's saying that certain things need to change to make that market more favorable to companies that he invests in. And that's happening. Some of that's happening via changing public schools as the way they can, sort of the way as we conceive them exist so we can change how they procure things. Another interesting trend is bypassing schools entirely. You go to, go to parents and students directly. And these products are almost always offered for free, right? And something we know is that if you have a free product, it's not, the, 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 the app itself isn't the product. It's the user's data, right? And so having some measure of sway over regulations about student data could be really valuable if you are building and investing in companies that do that. And there's a really good piece. I feel like uh, there's like a, a minimum one model view culture shout out per talk, but there's a really good piece in model view culture by Jesse Irwin talking about surveillance and ed tech and that being a new and lucrative model. Okay, so, so what? So I, I put this slide in here because I want to cut off a conversation that I'm not that interested in having after this talk, which is that I'm sure I don't really want to hear about how, you know, your niece is in this charter and it's amazing or your cousin to teach for America and it changed their lives. I don't dispute that, right? Technology in the classroom is not inherently bad, and I think the charter school argument is actually really complex. And I don't want to imply that the two million students currently in American charter schools are deluded, or that, and their parents are as well, or that the admins and educators who work at those schools and work very, very hard in those schools are evil or scheming for profit. However, what we have here is a private infrastructure being built under our noses by people who are publicly advocating for less democratic processes in order to serve their own economic interests and that bothers me. I think it should probably bother you too, right? Um, public schooling is one of like the foundations of our democracy and has been as long as our democracy has been conceived. And if you, whether you agree or disagree with school reform, our ability to have that conversation at all is being usurped. And it's being usurped with our, our own labor, with money we're generating, right? As tech workers, those of us who do work in tech. I think that's disturbing in and of itself. And there's something else that we know about tech and tech companies. That is that they imitate each other. You know, you, get, you go from Uber to having Uber, Lyft, and Sidecar. Sometimes they imitate and improve on each other. So you had a MySpace and now you have a Facebook. And so I wanna point out at the end of this talk a model where I see this same um, pattern being applied again. Does anyone know who this is? 
Okay, see this is how I know this is an Oregon audience. This is Ron Conway, and if we were in San Francisco, people would know who he is. Ron Conway is an enormously prolific angel investor, and he's invested, he made early investments in Airbnb, in Google, in PayPal, in Twitter, in Zynga, in Facebook, in BuzzFeed, Reddit, Pinterest, Mint, Square, over 200 and, 650, I'm sorry, other tech companies. You have interacted with a Ron Conway investment today, I'm almost sure of it, in some way. This is his most impressive investment to date, the city and entire political apparatus of San Francisco. And I'm not exaggerating by this, he paid to have our mayor elected and paid to have seven of our board of, seven members of our 12 board of supervisors elected. Um, this is not a secret, this isn't me being tinfoil hat, this is all very public record and a thing that's happened out in the open. Um, he's used his sway to enact laws to, that are favorable to companies he invests in, the Twitter tax break or the Airbnb short-term rental law being two examples. He's also set up a lot of public-private partnerships, which him and Ed Lee, who's his um, sort of, I think they've even said protege before, uh, are really famous for, with the school system, and with notably for this talk, the SFPD. Why, why that? Well, he has a um, pet cause, Ron Conway does. And in response to Sandy Hook, he came out and he said, look, gun safety is where I'm focusing my philanthropic efforts. And that's a really interesting word to use philanthropic because what he's actually doing is um, investing in an entrepreneurship challenge. And he said, I am looking for the Mark Zuckerberg or Larry Page innovator for gun safety. He's offering to invest money into companies that offer technological solutions for gun violence. And that can be a private owner, owner market, but it also, the, one of their challenges has been community safety. So I'm doing this because that means police. When you hear the word community in, in terms of politics, it almost always means police. Um, his partner in announcing this challenge, Ian Sobieski, said, there is money to be made. Gun violence is expensive to society, and there is a big market for, potential market for solutions. He would note one of his investments that he's very proud of is SST Inc., which used to be called ShotSpotter. ShotSpotter is a audio gunshot detection tool that's been that's, uh, installed in many companies or, or many cities around the country. Um, the idea being that it has these microphones that activate when a gunshot is detected and it alerts the cops. It turns out ShotSpotter is on all the time and records conversations. Um, that may, at least in the case of Oakland, have been a feature, not a bug. Um, Oakland being one of their big pilot cities. Oakland also is in the midst of attempting to build a domain awareness center, which is a hub for surveillance data for police. And the way that, that, that it's supposed to work is that all of this data is sucked in from various sources, including shot spotter microphones and surveillance cameras and things like that. And it's run through data analysis software, face detection software, um, machine learning algorithm software. What I'm getting at is that there's a lot of software that's needed to make these domain awareness centers work. And it's being designed explicitly with an eye towards future integration of additional tools and software, ensuring there'll be an ongoing market for this. So far, most of the bids for that one in Oakland have been military contractors, but Google actually, we found out via a Freedom of Information Act last year, put in a bid. They already have products that do this that they've marketed to other municipalities. In New York, Microsoft helped develop a domain awareness system and markets it to other municipalities now. It's called, I, this is so Orwellian, I hope y'all are ready. It is called the Automated Workspace for the Analysis of Real-Time Events, Microsoft Aware. <laughs> Yeah, this is a market that exists and is growing. Um, it's called predictive policing. Often, um, some of the big company or the, some of the companies that are mm, innovating, disrupting in predictive policing are Predpol, Hunch Lab, Street Cred. There's over 150 um, law enforcement startups listed on Crunchbase. If you go look it up in AngelList. So those are directed at police and sort of marketed as being police friendly. This is a body camera, and these have been in the news a lot lately. Um, body cameras are less welcomed with open arms by police, but there's increasing clamor for, to outfit police with them, and for very good reasons. Um, a thing that I haven't seen as much of is discussion of who makes body cameras. And so the biggest manufacturer of them um, currently in this country is Taser, who also makes non-lethal non um, stun guns. Now, 
Taser's approach to profitability with body cameras is interesting. Body cameras themselves are not that expensive to make or sell. The way, the, really the cash cow for Taser is a cloud-based storage solution to store all this footage, right? That's central to their company's plan for profitability. Their cloud offering is called evidence.com and it's, it's really touted as the way they're gonna continue to make money long-term from this body camera plan. Um, the sort of policies around how evidence.com works in terms of retention and redaction and release are generally not really known to the public. Um, I think that there's, you know, again, this is another, another situation where we have an argument happening that has really good arguments on both sides, but I think there's reason to be concerned about what Taser's motivations are in a cloud offering for body cam evidence. There are two members of the board that I think are really interesting in view of this strategy, which is Heidi Partovi, who's the director of code.org. Um, he worked at Microsoft and MySpace before that. And Brett Taylor, who worked at Google Maps and was the CTO of Facebook for a long time. These are people who have really sort of strong experience with um, surveillance and with evidence collection and with profitable cloud strategies, right? Again, it's not that the cameras are bad, but what are the incentives there? We're not really examining that for the people that are um, making them. And what we're seeing with Taser specifically is that they are pursuing extremely aggressive and potentially illegal sales strategies. So um, the chief of police in Albuquerque recently was fired because of his handling of the Taser contract. In SF, there started to be sorts of details leaked out about these no-bid contracts. Um, I would argue that the legal barriers here are actually more easily surmountable than those that have been steamrolled by the charter school movement. And I think we're gonna start to see police reform, which is a worthy and important movement, start to get funded, bankrolled, funded, and steered by people who are making products who would stand to profit by these things being enacted. So, what's my point here? This is my last slide. Um, I think we all make trade-offs to pay the bills. Um, I don't really mean to guilt anyone out specifically here about this, about what our tech money is funding, right? Does this happen everywhere? Sure, all sorts of industries have lobbyists, right? But we're sort of, um, I feel like we seem a little determined to ignore the broader context of the economy we work within. I did a lot of research for this talk, but I am a programmer. I'm not someone with a special background in this. I wasn't like filing Freedom of Information Acts. These were all news articles. Journalists are following this, and yet I'm surprised about how little we, and I include myself in that, know about what our industry is doing. Um, our act, the activism around this, I do, okay. <laughs> I've given this talk a couple times and people keep telling me it's a bummer. So I'm gonna try to wind it up on a positive note. And I do think there is, it's scary and overwhelming, but I, if there's one positive note I can take out of this, when I was telling you about those school board elections where they're pouring just an order of magnitude of more money than's ever been poured into these school board elections, $350,000 like is a lot of money per like potential voter even in a school, on a school board level. They won a lot of those elections, but they didn't win all of them. And I do think that at that level, you've got a scale where those are still winnable even without that financial backing. And there's, when you look at stuff like police contracts, a lot of those businesses are done in, you know, they're done in city, they're done in boring, not sexy spaces, right? It's, I've been to City Hall and I've sat in those meetings and it is not the most exciting form of activism, but it actually can have real impact. SF, for one, um, local activists without huge bankrolls have managed to keep taser, the actual taser stun guns out of SFPD hands for over a decade just by going to meetings and backing it up. I think we can do this. And I think not just as citizens, it's our responsibility to, as tech workers specifically, because in my mind, right, like we're doing this in, like, we're, that's maybe, okay. People in this room and out of this room are doing amazing, incredible, awe-inspiring work to fix some of the really serious problems inside of tech and to open the doors to see who's in there, right? And to fix the problems in there so we're not just funneling more people in to a shitty situation. It's amazing work. Those of you that do it, I, I am so proud to boost your voices and to join in with you. I do think if we are doing that hard and critical and incredibly important work, to open the doors to more people when the, the policies being enacted with the labor of ourselves and the people we're welcoming into tech are chewing up 
communities on the outside. That's not even like a toxic pipeline, that's like love canal. So I think we have to look, my final thought, is we have to start looking at who's funding our work, where our labor is going, and how we can build systems to make tech and to make tech that's sustainable, usable, and that supports people's livelihoods without depending on venture capital. Thank you. And there's, you can check all my sources at this link.